Somebody say glory. Glory. Thank you, thank you, thank you. One announcement I failed to make that I want to make <coughs> due to Harriet being in the uh, Bahamas on a mission trip and Georgianne being in Kentucky on a school, uh, music school trip, I will be doing the choir Wednesday night. We're going to practice one song. It's going to be Heaven Came Down. That's next Sunday's song. If you could show up and give me five minutes of your time, I would appreciate it. Okay? If you do that, Harry will send you $10. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you have joined us in this wonderful worship service. I trust and pray that those who listen by way of the internet will be blessed as we are just by being in this place called Providence and the sanctuary of God where we're surrounded by love, surrounded by peace and harmony, and that God's presence is felt in this service today. Amen. This is the second message on freedom. Last week we talked about the freedom to live. Today we're going to be talking about the freedom to love. Now let me start off by telling you when I began this message, I did not intend it to be a message on marriage, but it kind of gravitated that way. I'm not apologizing for it because I'm sure that everybody in here can use a little message on Marriage. Amen. Amen. One day there was this pastor that was asked to come to a house and perform a wedding ceremony. Now the pastor didn't know the couple, but they were in the community, so he felt like it was a good service, an opportunity to witness to them, and he took it up. So he went to this home, and there was the man, all dressed up, in a white shirt, and tie, and pants, and the bride was in her wedding gown with a veil across her face. Okay. Well, he performed the ceremony, and after the ceremony was over, Man took the pastor off to the side and said, How much owe you, preacher? And, and, the, and the pastor said, Whatever you think she's worth. <laughs> so the man reached in his pocket and pulled out a quarter. <laughs> Gave the quarter to the preacher. Well, the preacher didn't miss a lick. He walked over there to the woman, lifted up the veil, lifted it back down, walked over and gave the man 15 cents change. <laughs> Bibles with this morning, I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, reverence to God and His holy, infallible word. May we stand together as we read. We're just going to look at one little verse, and that is verse 13 of this wonderful chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. And now abide it's faith, hope, and charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Lord, we ask that you bless the preaching and the reading of thy word this day. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Be seated. There are a lot of emotions, emotions that are connected to the word love, L-O-V-E. There's the picture of the newborn baby resting upon her mama's arms. And you can just see and feel the radiation of the love between the newborn baby and the mother. As the child grows, he gets a kitten, or she gets a kitten or a puppy, and they learn a new meaning of love. And when the loss occurs between that person and that animal, it is a great loss because they have been so attached by a thing known as love. And then later on in life, you meet friends. And friends learn how to react to one another, and they learn to love one another. And it's a wonderful relationship, sort of like David and Jonathan had in their relationship together. It went beyond family ties because Saul didn't like David, but it was a tremendous respect and love for one another. And then you grow up and you are introduced to the person that you consider spending the rest of your life with. And the love that goes here and there and the bonding that takes the place, it is almost like a fairy tale. And anybody who's experienced that kind of romance, you know what I'm talking about. But understand me this morning, there is no greater disappointment in life than to have someone that you have loved, someone that you have shared life with, maybe even have had children with, to tell you, I don't love you any more. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of love. I want to cover three points that are on the screen this morning. Love is the greatest emotion. Love can be destroyed, but 
thank God, love can be restored. Now, why do you think that Paul said that the greatest of these is love? He said, you got faith, you got hope, those are important. But I promise you, there is nothing any greater than love. Because it talks about the very nature of God. You and I are made in the image of God. And when you and I, brothers and sisters, can find a way and the ability to show love, we are being divine. And when we show it freely, we are really, really on top of the mountain. But think of all the adjectives in the Bible that talks about God. And God is love. That's not an adjective. But He's so loved. And then He commended His love. Now the first mention of love in the Bible occurs in Genesis 22. It's just talking about Abram and he was asked to take his only son, the son that he loved dearly, who was Isaac, up to the mountain and sacrifice him. Now we know how the story went. He obeyed God, but God intervened and he did not have to sacrifice his son. But you see, Isaac was special to him because Isaac was the child of his old age that he never thought he would have, but God graciously gave him to him and there was a special bond of love. Now you've probably noticed, I think I've mentioned this before, that when it talks about love in, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, it does not use the word love. The King James writers, when they were writing this, they read that and said, you know, we can't use the word love. Because believe it or not, back in those days, in the 1600s, love was just as misconstrued as it is today. And people will say, well, they're going to think we're talking about a physical attraction. And so they changed the word from love to charity. Now, if you look at those words in the dictionary, love is talked about as a greater emotion and affection that you can have. But then there's the word charity that simply means to give. To give. And what a great description, friends, of love. Giving, giving, giving. The story is told that uh, Abraham Lincoln was sitting in the old office one day and at the end of the day, there was a lady came in with milk and cookies and sat it down in front of him. On her way out, he stopped her and said, Man, what is this? Oh, they're for you. I know you've had a hard day, and I thought maybe you could use something. He said, Lady, let me tell you something. All day long, there's been people in and out of my office, and every one of them came to get something. You are the only person that came to give. Amen. Now, understand something, brothers and sisters. We live in a perverted world. We live in a fallen world, and the devil is the chief pervert. Now, perverting something means to change the natural order. And so what he tells young people today, he said, oh, love is all about physical attraction. Get that physicality right, and then everything else will fall in place. But if you want a love, friends, that follows the pattern of God, you first start with the spiritual. I don't know why it is. I think we need a two-by-four to knock young people in the head and let them understand. Listen. You don't just fall in love with anybody. You just don't throw your affection and your emotions toward anybody. You start with a Christian. Somebody that knows God and loves God and will have a spiritual influence on your life and the life of your children. You start with the spirituality. You know God and if you know God and God brings your hearts together, when your hearts are joined, then comes the physical attraction. So that's the emotion of love. But understand this morning, friends, I do believe with all of my heart that love can be destroyed. There are a lot of lies going around about love today. Here are some of them. True love never fades. That's a lie. My soulmate will always understand me. Another lie. I just know that there's somebody out there that is compatible with me. That's a lie. You don't look for somebody who, can, who is compatible with you. You look for somebody who gives a strength to your weaknesses because God specifically told us that I'm giving you a helpmate and that helper, friends, complements your strength and gives strength to your weaknesses. And then uh, another lie will go on. If they love you, they will love all of you. Those are lies. Let me tell you how love gets destroyed, Okay? There's a four-letter word that connects itself to marriage, and it is not L-O-V-E. It is W-O-R-K. You're going to have a strong relationship, brothers and sisters, you are going to have to work at it. There's a 
story over in the book of Genesis in chapter 29 about Jacob. He was going to seek a bride. And you know the story of how he loved Rachel. He met her, fell in love with her at first sight. He said, i got to have this lady. So he went to her dad and said, hey, listen, you've got to let me have this woman. He said, all right, if you work seven years, you can have it. But there was a little fine print loophole in the clause that said the old one had to get married first. And you know how he worked uh, like a dog for seven years. And he said, I'm here for Rachel. He said, no, no, no. Lee has to go first. She's the oldest. He said, now if you work seven more years, you can have Rachel. And so there for 14 years, he worked hard to get the love of his life. The point is this, brothers and sisters, that he worked hard to fall in love with Rachel. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. When people want to find somebody and courtship begins, they work and work and work. They labor hard in everything that they do. There's the phone calls. There's the flowers. There's the letters. There's the cards. There's the visits. There's the uh, dressing appropriately. Everything fits, friends, in the fact of the courtship. Oh, I got a quarter, I got to look good, I got to be good, I got to watch my words, I got to watch what I do because I'm working hard to win that person's love. But guess what happens? <clears throat> when the marriage comes around and the contract is stopped, marriage becomes destroyed because the couples stop working. You can believe that if you want to. And I, I promise you, brothers and sisters, we live in a day when divorce is rampant. And if you could point a finger back at what happened, they lost the ability of the, of the honeymoon. They lost the ability to have that courtship attitude. I believe it would be good just to do away with the divorce altogether. Outlaw, now, let's do it first of all. We can say that. Amen. No divorce is allowed whatsoever. However, every 10 years, you had to renew your contract. We do that with driver's license. After 10 years, don't you imagine that would create some wonderful conversations around the supper table? Say, this is our 10th year, honey. You gonna, you gonna sign up again? Huh? And there's the, there's the fact that, well, I don't know, you ain't been too good to me lately. You, know, you, you ain't, you ain't worked around the house. You ain't done nothing to me. Why should I sign up? Because we got the 90 days, please. And there'll be panic and metal. But you have to re up to keep the marriage going. Really, that'd be pretty good, I think. Because at least there would be some doubt along about the work that has to be done. Amen? Amen. You see, there's some tools that people need to survive uh, the marriage relationship. One that I use a great deal in a premarital relationship and in other situations too is the talking rock. Now, how many of you ever heard of the talking rock? This is a talking rock. I've got I've had more weddings this year, and I, I think I gave them all a talking rock. I'll make sure the other student gets a talking rock. But you see, this rock is very important. And when you, if you don't have a talking rock in your home, you need to go down to the river, and you need to get you a talking rock, and you need to take it home. It needs to become the most important part of your marriage. Okay? Well, what does a talking rock do, preacher? Well, I'll tell you what it does. When a crisis comes in your marriage between the husband and wife, and believe me, they will come. You ran in there, you, you run in there, and you get this rock off the mantle. Okay? You show it to your mate, and no matter what they're doing, they have to stop everything they're doing. They have to come and sit down, and they have to listen to you. Now, this is why it's a talking rock. Because as long as you got this rock, rock, you doing the talking, and whoever ain't got the rock has to listen. Can you imagine that? I promise you, brothers and sisters, Communication is a wonderful thing. If you ain't got a talking rock, you probably need one. Okay? Now there's something else that I give as far as advice to married couples. You need me time and you need we time. You see, you've got to keep the relationship strong. Now that means that when y'all come together, you are still individuals. When people lose their relationship, a lot of times it's because they lose their individuality and they become clones of one another. You have to maintain that you are the person that she said I do to or vice versa. Now how do you do that? At least once a week there needs to be me time. If it's nothing but a 15 minute walk through the woods, there's a day that said, honey, I need a day to myself. 
You need to understand, I got to be me, and I got to go do this and that, and this is the time for me, it's going to be separated from you, and I have to have it. And the man and the woman both have to have me time. But you also have to have we time. Now, what is we time? After you marry, you need to keep dating, okay? Once a month, you need to set aside a time when you go on a date. You find somebody to watch the kids, you find whatever you need to find, make sure that there's nothing interfering, and you get some movie passes, and you go buy some popcorn and some Diet Coke, and you watch a movie, and that's your wee time. But you do a date night once a month, and whatever you do, you never neglect the wee time, because you have to work to keep them just as hard as you had to work to get them. Amen? It's very, very important. Now, the third thing you now have to do to keep a marriage going is remember the purpose of marriage. Again, it's not physical attraction. The purpose of the marriage is for you to help your spouse to grow spiritually. Never have I seen people on the same spiritual level in a home. Very rarely that happens. Somebody's on an eight, somebody's on a three. Well, you can do one or two things. You can just go on and leave your spouse behind, but you're not fulfilling the call of God on your life and your marriage if you do that. What you need to do is to bring your spouse along. They're the spiritual weak one, and that is your purpose in marriage to see your spouse grow into that person that God wants them to be. I heard a story one time of a man that took his pig down to the county fair. And man, he was interested in winning the prize. That was the nicest pig you've ever seen. He had washed it and shined and every bristle was clean. Had a pink ribbon on the tail. But right next to the pig was the man's younger, his son. And he looked over there at the son and the son had matted hair, dirty face, ragged clothes. And so the man had taken his attention from what it should have been on. And he turned it to the pig, so he was giving his love and affection to something other than his boy. Friend, I want you to know that's a story that happens too often in folks' relationships. Well, love can be destroyed. You neglect it, you don't work on that relationship that you have. One of these days, brothers and sisters, you will hear those dreaded words, I don't love you anymore. But listen to me this morning. Love can be restored. To go forward in your relationship, you have to go backwards. In other words, don't take a step forward. Take two steps backward and then take a deep breath and say, there's something that needs to be done. It's kind of like standing tall. If you want to stand tall, you have to kneel. It's a time in your life and your relationship, brothers and sisters, when you learn two very important words in every relationship. I'm sorry. Now listen to me. I ain't saying you're guilty of anything. But you got to understand, friends, in a home that you're living with somebody who was brought up different from you, walls continue to be built. Walls continue to be built, and every little incident or every little uh, harsh word that is not dealt with, that's why the Bible says never let the sun go down on your rack. The wall keeps building up and building up. And every day, brothers and sisters, that you do not learn to tear that wall down, another brick is added. One day you'll wake up and say, what happened to my relationship? What happened to our marriage? Well, brothers and sisters, you fail to remember two very important words. I'm sorry. You see, somebody told me this one time. I think it's true. There's three sides of every, relation, uh, uh, every argument. Okay? There's your side. There's your spouse's side or friend's side. And there's the truth. And there's the truth. Have you ever thought, and I know this is hard for you to grasp, especially if you're a man, have you ever thought that you might be wrong? Have it ever dawned on you that you might be wrong? No, 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 that ain't going to happen. But every time we point a finger, brothers and sisters, at anybody, there's three pointing back at us. So, you have to learn to tear down those walls. And the best way to do it, brothers and sisters, is just take your hat in hand and say, listen, I'm sorry, we need to just start over. We need to go back to the courtship days. We need to go back to the time when things were alive and there was fire burning in our soul. And we need to get that four-letter word straight. W-O-R-K. I know you remember the story of Hosea and Gomer in the Bible. 
This is a very popular story about a prophet that God told, go out among the prostitutes and find your bride. Now, God was going to teach Hosea a lesson, but he wanted a lesson to be learned by the human race. And last I looked, that includes all of us. Okay? He told Hosea, go find Gomer. Now, God knows everything, so he knows what Gomer was going to do. So after several years of marriage, Gomer decided to go back to her old life, and she did. She went back, she was sold into slavery, she became a sex slave. And God said, Hosea, I want you to go and I want you to find your bride. You go, you pay whatever money you have to pay, you bring her home again because that's what I want you to do and it's the right thing to do. And so he did. He went and took Gomer off the slave block, brought her back home, and the relationship flourished from there and they lived happily ever after. Now we don't know what happened, we just don't know what's between the lines of what went on in the relationship. But we know, brothers and sisters, that God taught Hosea something, he taught Gomer something, and he taught us something if we'll only willing be willing to listen. There's something about unconditional love that has to be a part of every relationship. Unconditional. God's got it for us. That's why I put the story in the Bible. And somewhere along the line, brothers and sisters, our spouses need to know that we love them unconditionally. I think it's good every now and then just to grab your spouse and give a big old uh, smack on the lips and honey, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to stay right here through thick and thin. You can chain me to the bed. It ain't going to happen. We ain't going to be here because when I married you and I said I do, I was giving my unconditional love to you. You see, the marriage vows have to mean something. We stand before the preacher and I've repeated them so many times I almost know them by memory. But sometimes friends are just vows, just words. But right there in the middle of it, there's a phrase that says something that we need to listen to. I take this person for better or for worse. Now the man of Sally came up and said, well, preacher, she's worse than I took her for. <laughs> but unconditional love, brothers and sisters, is how you keep your marriage strong, and it's how you bring your relationship back to where it ought to be. And lastly, there's a story of Jesus and Peter. Now, we know all about that. We know about the life of Peter, and we know all of his failures and all of his faults and how they were celebrated. But look at the earnestness that Jesus had about Peter. Where's Peter? i got to go find him. I'm going down by the seashore. I know where he is. You told me he's down there. I'm going. I'm going to find him. How long did he look? We don't know. But brothers and sisters, when he found them, it was a dialogue for the ages. He said, Peter, do you love me? Not one time. Not twice. Peter, do you really love me? Do we have that bond together? He said, well, Lord, yes, you know I love you. He said, well, why don't you just do what I ask you to do? Now, Peter never became a saint. Okay, I don't care what Catholics say. But he did become a useful vessel. He started living, he stopped living for the flesh, and he started ministering for God. Even to the point that one, when he told Jesus, I'm going to go to the cross and die with you, we know that was a, 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 a sham. But he did end up dying on the cross like Jesus. But he said, I want to die upside down because I'm not worthy to die like my Savior. So Peter wasn't perfect, but there was a love relationship. Jesus accepted Peter like he was. He did. He did. He really did. Because he saw the goodness in him rather than the bad. There are other verses that we could look at. And I'll do that and we'll close. A friend loves at all times. I've had three best friends in my life. You very have, very still have many. First was Joe Prater. He lives in 96. Now, Wayne out of Premier, he still lives on Lydia Mill. And then Wayne Deets, you know him. He's been on our mission trips. Those are three friends that I've had throughout my life. But, old brothers, I want you to know something. There is not a, a better day in all of creation than all of a sudden when the person that you married 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago is not no more your lover, but they have become your best friend. Amen. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. And I can tell you, brothers and sisters, there's no better friend in this world that I have than Miss Donna Lott. She's there. 
You see, friends tell you things that you don't always want to hear or need to hear, but nobody tell you. Your breath stinks. Yeah. <laughs> you zip your pants up. Yeah. Huh? Going home. You shouldn't have said that in your sermon today. <laughs> okay, it's done. Don't beat me no more. Now, if your spouse walks in and says, Do I look fat in this outfit? You're on your own. <laughs> Here's another one. No greater love has this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. Amen. Jesus is our example. He told us we were his friends and he went out and proved it. Okay? If love is going to be part of your life and if you're a child of God, brothers and sisters, you have to learn to love divinely. We know the three things of love in the scriptures. The eros, the erotic love, the physical attraction. We know the philios, that's the, that's the brotherly love. That's important. But friends, to be like God and to really, really get by this world, you must learn to love a godly love divinely. Stand with me, please.